in, in such circumstances, if, if you don't at least speak out clearly, and you, you are participating to, to the genocide. I mean, if you just shut up when you see what you see, I mean, morally, ethically, you cannot shut up. It's responsibility to, to talk, to speak out. A Rwandan human rights activist traveled to Washington. She'd been smuggled out of Kigali after a harrowing ordeal. Monique Mujawa Maria came to tell American officials what was happening in her country and ask for stronger U.S. action. The first person who I met when I arrived in the United States was Anthony Lake, who at the time was National Security Advisor. I will always remember him. He was very pleased to see me. Well, I met with Monique and was moved and terrified uh, for her by her story of barely escaping, uh, hiding in the attic for a while and then uh, getting out. I think he was personally affected by what was happening in Rwanda. But as a government official, he was not ready to take action. He didn't want to. And it's not that I didn't care. It's that any caring wasn't translated into any focus, any attention, really. On something like this, it would have taken quite a push. And there's no question in my mind that in the end, the president would have had to push it. A congressional official responsible for Africa gave me an explanation which was discouraging but also enlightening. He said, listen, Monique, the United States has no friends. The United States has interests. And in the United States, there is no interest in Rwanda. And we are not interested in sending young American Marines to bring them back in coffins. We have no incentive. As Monique lobbied Washington, America and the entire UN Security Council voted to withdraw 90% of the peacekeepers in Rwanda. This was the compromise Madeleine Albright had argued for. At least a token force was allowed to remain. It was, a, it was a very, very difficult time, and the situation was unclear. You know, in retrospect, it all looks very clear, but when you were at the time, uh, when it was unclear about what was happening in Rwanda, uh, it was very clear that Congress was not supportive of additional peacekeepers, very clear that the Pentagon uh, was not interested in getting deeply involved. What was your gut feeling about the effectiveness of, the, of that force that was being left behind? Well, I think that my gut feeling was that it couldn't do what it had to do. It was like the world had disappeared out there. The world just didn't care. Uh, and it made no difference what you said or how you said it to them. We could have packed up dead bodies, put them on a herc, flown to New York, walked into the Security Council and dumped them on the floor in front of the Security Council, and all that would have happened was we would have been charged for illegally using a UN aircraft. Um, uh, they just didn't want to do anything.
Forget any idea that somebody's going to come and, and help you, Dallaire, or, or your forces, and that we're going to actually do something positive. We're just going to continue the movement that the Belgians have started of withdrawing and withdrawing and pulling out. That, that scenario brought an enormous bloom because there's no cavalry coming over the hill. General Dallaire was left in Kigali with only 450 ill-equipped troops from developing countries. Now he faced the moral burden of bearing witness to a genocide without the means to stop it. He was abandoned by his own organization. This is terrible. To be abandoned by his own organization, it's terrible. I was always supported. It's a big difference, a huge difference. We needed uh, surgeons, nurses, I mean, this kind of very specialized stuff, you know. It arrived to Rwanda within days. It's very, very efficient, very short. They came. Some people had to be changed because some people got crazy. But then you find other people who yeah, able to take risks and to, to do the very little things you can do, which are always miracles, do miracles. That's, yeah, in such context, it's the only way to do something, I guess. It's Monday, 25th of April. It's a rainy, cold day. Day before the beginning of the historic elections in, in South Africa. And rockets have just been flying over the house. Carl Wilkins, the only American not to evacuate from Rwanda, hadn't left his home in nearly three weeks. And so when I went out, it was, it was wild. There were horses roaming the streets, and there's no horses in Rwanda except at the Belgian club, and someone, I guess, had let them out of their stalls, and there were guys sitting at roadblocks in couches, you know, and, and they'd have an old shotgun across their lap, and they'd have, like, a monkey, you know, on a leash, some foreigner's pet who had fled. Little kids were playing with all kinds of Western toys all over the city. Little Rwandan kids had never seen these toys before, much less been able to touch them and play with them. Um, it was, it was a wild place out there. Gromo Alex, a veteran UN aid worker, volunteered to come back to Rwanda and set up a humanitarian team in Kigali. Very few people get opportunities to be real heroes. So I wanted to be one of those, you know, one of those few. During the genocide, what was it like right here? Uh, very dead quiet. Barriers on most of the, uh, almost any road entering into the, into the neighborhood was blocked off with uh, tree stumps or logs or beer cases. Each day, Gromo Alex delivered food to refugees at UN safe havens in the city and learned to navigate the Interahamwe roadblocks. Started as early as we could in the morning, not too early. We tried to finish it as early in the afternoon as possible because at by noon, they had been drinking and were intoxicated. And they had either killed people and wanted to kill more, or they hadn't killed and they wanted to kill. Killing was like a drink that if you'd you took one drink, you wanted another one, and you wanted another. You wanted to become more and more intoxicated. Sometimes people kill once, and then to lessen the impact of that murder on their psyches or on their conscience, that they kill again, and then they kill again. And then each, each murder drives you to kill again, not so much that you forget that you've killed before, but that you've you've killed and 
it, it just becomes part of you, and you've just got to kill and kill. Four weeks into the genocide, the Red Cross estimated 300,000 Rwandans had been killed. I think the conscience of the world has grieved for the slaughter in Rwanda. But we also know from not only the Somali experience, but from what we read of the conflict between the Hutus and the Tutsis, that there is a political and military element to this. So I think we can take the lessons we learned and perhaps do a better job there. Uh, I think the problem here uh, for me, for the president, uh, for most of us at senior levels, uh, was that it never became a serious issue. We never uh, came to grips with what in retrospect should have been a central issue of do we do much more to insist that the international community intervene and go out and find the troops that are necessary or even contemplate uh, an American intervention itself. Uh, that issue just never arose. The administration left Rwanda to the bureaucrats, and an interagency working group led by the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Africa, Prudence Bushnell. I mean, what an extraordinary way to spend time. Hi, dear, I'm going off to the office today to sit with my people and talk about is there any way we can save um, human beings from being slaughtered when there are no resources, um, there's no peacekeeping. It was, uh, these were conversations I'll never, ever forget. Bushnell's hands, Bushnell's hands were tied by the government's policy of non-intervention. So when she called extremist Hutu leaders, she could threaten them only with words. Um, I would set the alarm for 2 o'clock in the morning and having these bizarre conversations in French. Hello, this is our Prudence Bush now. Stop it! Stop killing people! When she called General Kagame, the Tutsi rebel leader, Bushnell's instructions were to demand that he halt his advance and negotiate with the extremists. He it was always very dispassionate, but there was a burst in the middle of this conversation of a fair amount of passion when he said to me, Madam, they're killing my people. And it wasn't part of my instructions to be empathetic to, um, and yet it was, it really pulled at my heart because I knew they were killing his people. And uh, indeed, I talked to Pro Bushnell, and I hate remembering the conversation I had with her because uh, it always brings back those memories that while for us we are focusing on and seeing that Hundreds of thousands of people were being killed. Somebody else was talking about something else that had nothing to do with saving the lives of these people who are being killed. Uh, the only effort I could make as a human being to sort of reach out a hand of humanity um, by saying, as I signed off, General, I wish you peace. And that's the way I ended my conversations with him. Um, it was awful. Excuse me. It was really difficult. <laughs>